I have always loved sailing. Now, it makes no sense because I grew up landlocked. Uh, Huntsville is not near any beach or ocean, and certainly Nashville's not. Uh, and I, maybe that's why it's a fantasy, that there's something I can just think about and dream about when I don't really know anything about it. But I always used to tell my boys when, when they were growing up, they said, what do you really want to do? And I said, I want to get a boat, and I want to name it Visitation. And they said, why? And I said, well, when you call the office and say, where's the pastor? You can say, he's on visitation. <laughs> but there's something about something with no motor flying through the water like that. Do you know how fast the fastest boat is? This is it. This is the Vestas uh, Sail Rocket, version two. This thing goes 65 knots. That's 75 miles an hour for you uninitiated. Can you imagine going 75 miles an hour across the water? Yes, I can. <laughs> I always love watching the America's Cup. Have you seen these races? Have you seen these boats? They're amazing. In fact, they go so fast that they literally come up out of the water and they come up on what they call foils, little skis under, under the hulls. And these things pop up, on, which, makes, which begs the question, are they sailing or are they flying? Because if you're not in the water, you're not sailing, right? You gotta be in the water. It's amazing what they do. Now here's the interesting thing about the America's Cup. When they set up the track, when they, when they put out the course, uh, it is easier, it's, it's sometimes a triangle, sometimes it's a square. Uh, sometimes it's straight there and straight back. But here's what's going to happen in the course of that race. Somehow, somewhere, you're going to be sailing with all kinds of wind conditions. One, you're going to be sailing with the wind. The wind's going to be behind you, pushing your ship. Two, you're going to be sailing against the wind. That is, the wind will be in your face rather than behind your boat. Three, the wind is going to be across the boat. Uh, somehow blowing like, like a 90 degree angle from where you want to go. In each situation, the captain has to know how to angle the boat, how to set the sail so that he can catch the wind. A good captain can get to where he wants to go using nothing but the wind, regardless of which way that wind is blowing. Which brings us to an interesting point about our discussion on spiritual leaders. Spiritual leaders, like good captains, know how to catch the wind. The power of the spiritual leader is not the spiritual leader's power, but the power of the spirit blowing in that leader's life. Like a good captain, they know how to catch the wind. This is what Paul reminds us of in chapter 3 of the letter to, uh, to the Ephesians. Stand with me in honor of God's Word as we read his hymn of praise and celebration. For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I pray that he may grant you according to his riches and glory to be strengthened with power in the inner man through his Spirit and that the Messiah may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, the height and depth of God's love. To know the Messiah's love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church, and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, um, amen. So that you can comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width, height and depth of God's love. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. The prayer that Paul prayed so long ago that he wrote to his brothers and sisters in Ephesus. Lord Jesus, answer that prayer for us now. That we would know 
the height, and the width, the length, and the depth of your love, that we would be filled with your fullness and that we would see you do more than we could ever imagine. For we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, Paul just couldn't help himself. He does this all the time, especially after he completes a very difficult theological uh, statement. Uh, Romans 11, uh, Paul has gone through this very difficult, deep uh, uh, teaching about uh, how God is going to respond to, his, to the nation of Israel and how God is going to bring salvation to everyone. And at the end of it, he, he, he breaks out in song and worship. He does this all the time. It's like a bad musical. He, he, he'll, be, he'll be talking and preaching and teaching, and all of a sudden a piano rolls out and he just breaks out in song. This is a song. This is a hymn. And what's happened is Paul has been, has been uh, for some reason, he's under house arrest in Rome, but if for some reason he wants to write the brothers and sisters in Ephesus to encourage them. Now, Ephesus was a tough place to be a Christian. You remember some of the stories from when Paul was there. The silversmiths rioted and tried to kill Paul. Paul barely got out with his life. And in another letter, he talks about uh, wrestling with the dogs in, in Ephesus. It was a tough place to be a believer. But Paul had left this little church and they were a tough, tough little group of, uh, of, of Christ followers. And now he's writing this letter to encourage them. So begin. At the beginning of the letter, he talks about how God has been working across time and space to bring the good news of the gospel to this moment, to this place, and to the Ephesians themselves. God has been working uh, through Abraham. God has been working through the nation of Israel. God has been working through Paul's own preaching. And now the Ephesians have been chosen, picked. Now, Theologians get all tangled up in this, and I've told you before, the reason theologians get tangled up in this is because they never played enough ball. If they played more ball, they'd understand this. Uh, you remember you'd go out to the ball field, the basketball court, and you would choose teams, right? And the two best athletes would choose. Now, if one of, of those two athletes, one of them was better. One of them was good enough that it didn't matter who else was on his or her team, they were gonna win. The whole goal of the whole thing you had to do was to make sure that the best athlete chose you. And once they chose you, you were going to win. Didn't matter the game, didn't matter what was going on, you were going to win. What Paul is saying in these first couple of chapters of, of Ephesians is, listen, God has stepped into time and space and history in the person of Jesus Christ, walked up to you and me and said, you, I want you on my team, chosen, picked, not because of who you are, but because of who the captain is. Now you're going to win. Right. You're going to win. Why? Because you're good? No. No, you're going to have the same job I had when I played ball, throw the ball back. <laughs> okay? That's it. You're going to win. Why? Because Jesus is the captain of the team. That's it. Amen. Now, it doesn't matter about you. Listen, no, you just picked. You're chosen. That's all. And that's what Paul is talking about. You have been picked. You've been chosen. And he starts talking about all of this, and he just is, he's overcome with worship. He just breaks down. He, he, he can't write anymore. He's just got to stop and sing, stop and praise God for what he has seen God do and what he's seeing God do now. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever been in a place so overcome with the presence of God that you couldn't do anything next? That you had to stop? That you just had to stop and give a word of praise, a, a, a testimony, tell somebody what's going on? Has that ever happened? Okay, <clears throat> listen, just me and you, I know, we're friends, let's be honest. For most of us, that answer is no. Here's why. We didn't learn the lesson of David. You remember King David, Old Testament, the famous story of David and Goliath. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 17. When you read that story, something interesting comes up. David finds his brothers and they are fighting the Philistines. The Philistines have a champion, a guy named Goliath, who is huge. Okay, every morning Goliath comes out and challenges the Israelites to battle. 
Send your best dude out here, let's fight. Whoever wins, wins everything. There's no sense everybody fighting. Send your best guy out here. We'll fight, if he wins, you win. If I win, we win. And he does this every day. He's talking some serious trash. So David says to his brothers, who is this guy? They tell him. Why isn't anybody going out and fighting him? They tell him, he's huge. So David goes to Saul, who's king. I'll fight him. You're just a kid. How are you gonna fight him? Look at what David says. I kept my father's sheep. When the lion would come to try to steal the sheep, the Lord would give me the lion. When the bears would come, the Lord would give me the bears. He'll give me this Philistine. Now notice what David did. David wasn't looking at how big Goliath was, but how big his God was. Some of you spend way too much time looking at Goliath talking about how big Goliath is, how tall Goliath is, how impossible the situation is. You need to spend a little more time understanding how big God is. Which means you need to turn off cable news. You need to turn off cable television. You need to get rid of all that stuff. Listen, the world's in a mess. How many ways can we tell you that? (laughs) Do you need 24 hours of people telling you that? No. You need to turn off all that stuff, get in the Word. Get in the Bibles and start reading the Scriptures, start understanding how God, this is not the first time the church has faced a challenge like this. This is not the first time uh, we've been in a culture that opposed the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not the first time people have said, if you don't don't agree, we're going to put a lot of pressure on. We've been here before. Now, the reason we, we survive is because the church understands how big our God is. Spend a little more time looking at at God, not so much time looking at Goliath, okay? Now, when you do that, this is what Paul is praying for you. For this reason, I fall on my knees and I'm praying you'll be strengthened in the inner man, in the inner person. How many of you are reading books right now about how to find purpose in your life, about how to find uh, the meaning of your life, and you're looking for somebody, something outside. Some expert, some some professor to come in and tell you who you are. That starts with an inner conversation. That comes from the inside, flows from the outside. There's a reason Paul chose that word. I want you to know who you are I want you to know what you're about so that when you engage the public culture, they don't define who you are. They don't tell you what you're about. That comes from the blessing you have, the authority you have, the power you have about who you are from the indwelling of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand that, Paul, from, from, from that. I want you to be established in God's love. You know what that word means? Have you ever set a fence post? Okay, you dig a hole, you put the fence post in there, and then you fill the rest of that hole with concrete. And then you wait for that concrete to dry, and that pole is set. It's not going to move. You have to pull it up with a chain a pickup truck or a tractor or something. It's not going anywhere. Established. You have been placed where you are, surrounded by the presence of the risen Christ, and you are set in his resurrection. The power of who he is. And nobody's going to move you. Established in his love. I want you to comprehend. That word means to grab hold of, to seize. I want you to know, comprehend the vastness of God's love. Really, Paul. Now, we're used to Paul taking a little hyperbole every now and then. 
But how can you know what you cannot know? Right? You can't know the love. There's no limit. There's no top. There's no bottom. There's no side. Uh, there, there, how, do, how do you get this? That's what exactly what Paul say. I want you to be swimming in God's love. So that when you go up, you're in God's love. When you go down, you're in God's love. You go left to right, you're in God's love. I want you to be lost in God's love. And I want you to know the love of the Messiah that surpasses all understanding. Paul, that's twice now. How can you know what you're saying we cannot know? I want you to know what you can't understand. In our world, we're spending a lot of time arguing with scientists who say that scientists, scientism is this thing that science has the answer to everything. No, it doesn't. And there are things where, there are places science can't go. There are things science cannot answer. And you and I know there are things that we know that we can't understand, right? You see it every, you, you have that same experience every time you see me with Jeannie. Right? We know they're married. We know they're in love, but we don't understand that. Not at all, right? There are things you know that you don't understand. Paul says, I want you to be so deep in the person of Jesus that you know, even though you don't understand it. That you will comprehend, that you will know this God who is able to do more than you've ever dreamed. You know what's going to be hard when you stand in front of the judgment? Not that you failed. Not that you tried and didn't accomplish it. Not that you blew it. That's not going to be the hard moments. You know what's going to be the hard moment? It's when you realize what was possible that you never asked for. What was available that you never believed? What could have been if you'd only had the faith to take the next step? All that you could have had but didn't even know it was possible. Now, I need to stop here. This does not mean that Jesus will give you everything you ask for, okay? There's sometimes you'll hear this translated like, boy, just ask, no matter how impossible it is, Jesus will give it to you. Jesus is a loving father. Loving fathers say no. Loving fathers say no a lot. I used to tell my boys, you're asking me to put you in a place where I know you will not succeed. And we've had those moments, haven't we? You live long enough, you'll have that moment where long ago you prayed for something, wanted something, it made sense, it was right, and you asked Jesus for it, and Jesus didn't give it to you. And so you stayed a little mad. Okay, you wouldn't tell anybody that, but you stayed a little mad. Jesus should have given me this. One day I'm going to ask him about this. And then you get to the other side of it. And you look back and you crawl off to a quiet corner and go, oh, thank you, Jesus, so much. Just thank you so much. I just, Garth Brooks had a famous song about that, didn't he? Thank God for unanswered prayers. It's about going back and seeing all the girls he'd wanted to date at the high school reunion. <laughs> and he comes back and says, thank God for unanswered prayers. It doesn't say yes all the time. Here's what it does mean. He will give you what you wanted if you'd been smart enough to know it was possible. He will give you so that you, when you're there, you will say, I never thought I would, but I love this. This is the best place. This is the best me. I never understood that. All that you dreamed of, all that you can hope for, doesn't begin to come close to what God is able to do. 
Which brings us to a couple of questions. One, do you know that God is always working? God is always working. Now, he may not work in places where you think he should work or in the people you think he should be working in, but God works where he can work. Wherever he finds an open door, wherever he finds a crack in the window, the spirit moves, the wind blows, and lines are changed. People, God is always working. He wants to work in us and through us. He wants to work in your life so that you have all that he has dreamed for you. And he wants to use your testimony to begin to open up those kind of possibilities in somebody else's life. Now remember, it's not about you, it's about the captain who picked you. So in those moments when you're saying, I can't, he can. The only thing is you need to be there and available. He wants to work in us and through us, which leads us to this last question. Are you a good enough captain to catch the wind? Jesus was asked about the working of the Spirit, how lives are changed. Jesus' answer is the wind blows where it will. Are you a good enough captain to catch the wind, to align your life with what God is doing so that the kingdom happens wherever you are? Are you a good enough captain to catch the wind? You can do that if you spend more time looking at God than you do Goliath. Let's pray together.